Summer vacation starts today. It's nice to forget about math and go on a tropical vacation. That sounds wonderful. Take me with you. Mitten, why are you here? Whoa, this is... A problem has appeared. Mitten, whenever I'm with you, somehow there's always... How rude, you don't trust me? Sorry, I shouldn't jump to conclusions. Hey, be more careful next time. So about this problem... It says x times y equals x plus y. What could it possibly mean? Is this meant to be multiplication? It kind of looks like a multiplication symbol, but I'm not sure. Something that looks like multiplication and addition are somehow connected by an equal sign. This is quite a tricky problem. Well then, let's think it through, step by step. When it comes to turning multiplication into addition, exponential functions and the product rule come to mind. For example, if you multiply e to the x by e to the y, the result is e to the power of x plus y. In other words, the product of exponentials corresponds to the sum of the exponents. So the result of multiplication ends up as addition. It seems to be related to the problem from earlier. Also, the inverse function of the exponential function, the logarithm has similar properties. The logarithm of a product becomes the sum of logarithms. Let's develop this idea a bit further. First, we denote the logarithm with base t as L sub t equals log base t. In that case, x is mapped to log base t of x by L sub t. Here, r is the set of all real numbers, and r sub greater than zero is the set of all positive real numbers. Also, since the logarithm and the exponential function are inverses of each other, the inverse function of L sub t, written L sub t inverse max x to t to the power of x. Hmm, I see. Okay, using this mapping, let's bring multiplication from the left world into the right world. Huh? What do you mean? Now, we use L sub t inverse to bring x and y into the left world. That means they become t to the x and t to the y, respectively. We'll multiply these in the left world, and then bring the result back to the right world using L sub t. Let's denote it as x times y. Wow, that's an interesting idea. This really does seem like we're bringing multiplication from the left world into the right world through the function L sub t. Seems like you got it. Now then, how can we represent this as an expression? Um... First, we use L sub t inverse to bring x and y into the left world, right? Then we multiply them. We bring the result back to the right world using L sub t and denote it as x times y. Now let's proceed with this calculation. L sub t inverse maps x to t to the x and maps y to t to the y. And L sub t means log base t, right? Using the product rule here, we get this result. Therefore, the value of x times y is x plus y. We did a lot of steps in the middle, but the final result turned out super simple. This shows how multiplication turned into addition through the logarithmic function. Multiplication turned into addition. Then what does addition turn into? That's a good question. Then let's try thinking about addition the same way. Why do you write t here? Well, unlike the 4, I feel like the result depends on t this time. Let's just try it out for now. We bring x and y through L sub t inverse, add them together. And then bring the result back to our world using L sub t. So we just need to calculate this. Wait a second. What even is this expression? It's not addition or multiplication. This result turned into something really confusing. I wonder if we can simplify this expression any further. It's difficult to tackle directly. But here, if we let t approach infinity, the result becomes the maximum of x and y. What? Really? Um, why is that? Well, let me explain it intuitively first. Assume that x and y are not equal. As t grows, the gap between t to the x and t to the y increases more and more. If we assume x is greater than y, then t to the y becomes negligible. So the result becomes x. In other words, the larger of x and y is the answer. Well that makes sense, but are we really sure? Let me explain it a bit more rigorously. Suppose n is the larger of x and y. Since m is either x or y, t to the x plus t to the y is greater than t to the m. 
Also, x and y do not exceed m. So t to the x plus t to the y doesn't exceed 2t to the n. So far, that all makes sense. Now let's take logarithms with base t on all parts. Then the left-hand side becomes m. The middle expression matches x plus y we saw earlier. And the right-hand side has this part as log base t of 2. And the remaining part becomes m. Therefore, as t approaches infinity, log base t of 2 approaches 0. So by the squeeze theorem, the limit is m, that is the maximum of x and y. Let's simply write this value as x plus y. Oh, I see. I kind of feel like I understand it now. Are you sure? By the way, t is the base of the logarithm, so letting t go to infinity can be thought of as zooming out infinitely. What on earth is happening here? I feel like I just witnessed a strange world of addition and multiplication. Well, anyway, the problem is solved. Now my summer vacation can finally begin. Wait a minute. There's something else. What? Oh, what is this? Apparently there's a field of mathematics based on these two operations, called tropical geometry. Tropical geometry? That's a funny name. Hold on a sec. I see, it was named in honor of Imre Simon, a Brazilian computer scientist, and that's how the name tropical geometry originated. Wait, how did you find that out? Since we're here, why don't we explore this world a bit more? Hey, my summer vacation! It'll definitely be a good memory. Oh, you think so? As a side note, tropical addition is sometimes defined using minimum instead of maximum. But the two are dual to each other, and there is no essential difference between them. How do you even know that? Also, these addition and multiplication symbols might have different meanings in other fields, so be careful. Got it. First, let's see how the rules of regular arithmetic look in the tropical world. Soon, Demon, try calculating this expression. Um, it looks like we're adding x, y, and z, and the parentheses specify the order. In tropical addition, we take the maximum value. So first we take the maximum of x and y, like this. Then adding z to that just means taking the maximum with z, right? Taking the maximum of x and y, then the maximum with z, means we're really just taking the maximum of x, y, and z. Yes, that seems right. To be more exact, we probably have to break it down by cases, comparing x and y. But we don't need to go that far this time. No need at all. Here, if we think about it in reverse, we can also take the maximum of y and z first. In tropical addition, this is what it looks like. Exactly. The equation Sundaman just showed me also holds an ordinary addition. That means the result doesn't change no matter the order we add them, so the associative law of addition holds even in the tropical world. Since tropical addition is based on regular addition, it inherits similar properties. This is kind of fun! Now try calculating this expression. This time it uses both multiplication and addition. Hmm. First, addition represents taking the maximum. And multiplication represents regular addition, right? Now, taking the maximum of y and z, then adding x, is the same as adding x to each of y and z, then taking the maximum. That's an interesting way to look at it. You could break it down into cases based on which is bigger, but... No need to go that far this time. Now if we rewrite this in tropical style, it looks like this. I see, that's quite fascinating. We end up with a similar result again. The same thing holds with regular addition and multiplication. This rule is known as the distributive law. Hmm, so basically, tropical arithmetic can be done just like regular arithmetic. Are you sure about that? What do you mean? For example, in regular arithmetic, x plus x equals 2x. But in tropical arithmetic, x plus x becomes the maximum of x and x. So the result is just x. If you add x to x, it stays x. That feels kinda weird. Let's look at another example. In regular addition, if we include negative numbers, then for any a sub 0 and a sub 1, there exists exactly one number x such that adding x to a sub 0 gives a sub 1. But in tropical addition, 
adding x to a sub 0 means taking the maximum of a sub 0 and x, which is always greater than or equal to a sub 0. So no matter what you add to a sub 0, the result will never be less than a sub 0. In regular addition, changing x can make the result larger or smaller. But in tropical addition, you can't go backward. In other words, subtraction doesn't exist in the tropical world. Tropical arithmetic shares some properties with regular arithmetic, but also has differences. Let's stay sharp. Got it! Also, there are special values in regular addition and multiplication, right? First, what's the number that doesn't change the result when multiplied? Um, it is 1. Multiplying x by 1 gives you x. Yeah, that one's obvious. So, what's the number that doesn't change the result when you multiply it in the tropical world? That would be, of course, 1. Wait, hold on a sec. Tropical multiplication is actually regular addition. So the number that doesn't change the result when added, that's 0, right? Exactly right. Phew, that was close. So then, what I'm curious about next is, the number that doesn't change the result when added, that is, 0. What does that become in the tropical world? Since tropical addition is taking the maximum, it will be a number that doesn't affect the maximum. Is there even such a number? This might feel a bit like cheating, but the answer is negative infinity. What? Why does infinity show up here? Wait, but that kind of makes sense. Since there's no number smaller than negative infinity, taking the maximum with it doesn't affect the result. It feels weird to treat infinity as a number though. As a side note, in the minimum version of tropical geometry, adding positive infinity won't change the result. Okay, now I'm totally lost. Yeah, I get it. It's easy to feel lost with all this. Let's go back to basics for a moment. This is the diagram before we let t go to infinity. And in the tropical world, what we call x corresponds to the exponent in t to the x in the original world. It's a bit of a simplified view, but a number in the tropical world can be interpreted like the degree of a polynomial. Whoa, really? But we're dealing with real numbers in the tropical world now. And degree? Usually refers to integers, right? You're right about that. So just think of it as an intuitive explanation. Anyway, let's look at an example. Here, if we add a quadratic and a linear polynomial in T, the result is a quadratic. If we write this in tropical arithmetic, adding a quadratic and a linear, the result is still a quadratic. That's what it turns out to be. The maximum of 2 and 1 is 2. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, so tropical addition is like adding degrees. Only intuitively though. Technically, if the highest degree terms cancel, it becomes tricky. But let's not worry about that case here. Next, let's think about multiplication. Multiplying a quadratic and a linear in t, the result is a cubic. Hmm, I see. In tropical arithmetic, multiplying a quadratic and a linear results in a cubic. Because adding 2 and 1 gives 3 in the usual sense. That's what tropical multiplication is. Yes, looking good. And remember the special values we talked about earlier. In regular arithmetic, multiplying x by 1 gives x. And in tropical arithmetic, 0 plays that same role. Now, if we think of 1 as t to the power of 0, it feels natural that 0 appears as the degree, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that makes sense. So that's what it meant. Also, in regular arithmetic, adding 0 to x still gives you x. And in tropical arithmetic, negative infinity plays the same role. If we think of 0 as t to the negative infinity, then negative infinity naturally appears as the degree. So if that's how it works, I guess having negative infinity makes sense. By the way, when we hear geometry, we usually think of shakes. But this is tropical geometry, and we haven't seen any shakes yet. Now that you mention it, you're right. Alright then, let's do something more geometrical. We consider a tropical polynomial, which we'll call f of xy. In the tropical world, this adds x, y, and 0. In other words, we take the maximum of these values. If we treat that as addition, we can say it's a bivariate linear polynomial. Can you visualize this polynomial somehow? Visualize it? Huh? Well, it has two variables, 
So let's start by looking at it in the xy plane. In the bottom left region from the origin, both x and y are negative, so 0 is the biggest among them. That means f of xy takes the value 0 there. Outside of that, at least 1 of x square y is positive, so f of xy takes the larger of the two. If we draw a ray along y equals x, then f of xy takes x below it and takes y above it. Well done! f of xy takes values like this on the xy plane, and you can see that the maximum switches along three rays from the origin. Let's call this blue boundary part, the tropical line defined by f of xy. Since f of xy is linear in x and y, it makes sense to call it a tropical line. Wait a sec! It feels weird to call three rays a single tropical line. But what's even weirder is, why do we call the boundary the line defined by the polynomial? For example, take the regular bivariate linear polynomial f of x, y equals x plus y minus 1. If we consider the set of all x, y where f of x, y equals 0, that is, the set of points satisfying x plus y minus 1 equals 0, that makes sense. In this case it really does form a line. But in the case of tropical polynomials, why do we focus on the boundary instead of where the polynomial equals zero? That's an excellent question. However, this is a tough topic to discuss rigorously. So what I'm about to give you is just an intuitive explanation. Now let me explain why we focus on the boundary in tropical polynomials. Remember the tropical polynomial f of x, y we looked at earlier? And consider a regular polynomial f of t in a variable t. Let's ignore the coefficients for now. The degree of f of t is the largest exponent of t, which matches the value of f of x, y. Well, x and y are real numbers, so calling it a degree isn't strictly accurate. Huh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Here, powers of t are always positive. But if we allow signs, we can still get any non-zero value. Here, as t becomes large, the term with the highest degree becomes dominant. Now, instead of f of x, y, consider the condition that f of t equals zero. Even though these parts can take any non-zero value, the dominant terms still have to cancel each other out. That means at least two terms need to have degrees that are almost equal, and also the largest. This corresponds to the condition where multiple terms inside the maximum are simultaneously largest, which exactly describes the blue boundary part of the diagram, don't you think? You, you really think so? So that was the rough explanation of why we think of the blue boundary in the diagram as the tropical line defined by the tropical polynomial f of x, y. Hey, I guess that makes sense. I kinda get it, but also kinda don't. Yeah. This part is pretty tricky. Today we explored the strange world of tropical geometry. What did you think? Tropical geometry is a very geek field, and offers a totally different perspective from classical geometry. Do you actually understand it? Well then, take care everyone. See you later!